This service of worship brought to you by First United Methodist Church of Dardanelle. I'm Jim Benford, the pastor of the church, and I want to invite you to come and be with us for live worship where we get together each Sunday morning at 10.55 a.m. at our sanctuary here in Dardanelle. We have more information about the life, mission, and the ministry of our church available. You can call our office at 479-229-3720 or you can go to our website at fumcdardanelle.org. There you can find print and video resources for children and adults. We are the people of God, sharing the love of Christ and offering his grace to the world around us. Let us be in the spirit of worship. I believe in God the Father Almighty. maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
left to ourselves in the silence, it is hard to stop and reflect and know what to do with ourselves, for we are anxious always. We are busy making our plans, running uh, ahead of you, and, and seldom do we stop and listen for your voice to know what our next steps ought to be. So help us to be teachable. Help us to be attentive. Help us to listen to your voice. For we live in a world that's darkened by sin and trouble and evil. We also know that uh, many people run to and fro looking for meaning and purpose in life. Unable to find it in selfish pursuits. So help us, most of all, that we might listen to your voice. That we might know that life and proper relationship with you, Lord, most of all, and with others, will help us to find the right meaning and purpose as we serve you, finding those good qualities of life that were meant to bless and lengthen our living. We pray now as well for those who are lost in this dark world, who need a kind word to find forgiveness, to know that somebody cares, that we might show love to these that uh, are so lost, so help us to have hearts that speak of the gospel, that we might share good news with others around us, that they too might be able to come into your kingdom and know the source of all light in life. We pray for those who are hurt this morning, who have heard bad diagnoses from doctors or uh, medical tests, those who uh, suffer from infirmity and disease, we ask your healing grace according to your will upon these so that they might find healing once again, that they might glorify your name and reach out in love to others who hurt just like them. Father, we know that there are those who have lost loved ones and we ask that uh, you help them to reorder their lives and uh, find again that uh, love and purpose that you have for their own living. Now. We add to these prayers, prayers for our community, our church, that uh, we might live in such a fashion that others too can see the Christ within us. And so we add to this prayer, that prayer Jesus taught his own disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to take up tithes and offerings and give thanks to God as uh, we do so. Of course, uh, those of you joining us by this video are not going to be able to uh, give to the ushers coming by, but... We have a PayPal tab on our website where you can make a gift to the church. Also, we include a address on the doxology so that you can send gifts into the church and know that uh, we appreciate these gifts. We use them to the best of our uh, ability to be the best stewards of these monies that truly we might use them to leverage uh, God's kingdom forward in people's lives and uh, our ministry of uh, concern and care in this world around us. As we consecrate our gifts, let's go to God once again in prayer. Gracious God, with thankful hearts, we open our lives to you, giving of our resources, our time, our talents, our monies, that these things might find your blessing, that they might go to bring your kingdom into the hearts of men and women and children, that most of all, they may come rejoicing with us in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior as we seek to find once again that uh, common uh, goal that each of us has, which is to reach the kingdom of heaven. So bless these gifts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to go in God's word this morning to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2. Of course, Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, purported to be the wisest man on earth. And he writes to us about finding meaning in life. I'm going to chapter 2, beginning at the 17th verse, where Solomon writes these words. So I hated my life because of the work that was done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he'll be a wise man or a fool, yet he'll have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all the toilsome labor done under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labored under the sun? All of his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This, too, is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This, too, I see is from the hand of God, for without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal Father, Help us to heed the words of Solomon. Help us to find wisdom in all the things, all the work and toil we do each day so that in doing so, we might find the right purpose, the right meaning, and find enjoyment and blessing through it, we pray it. In Jesus' name, amen. We do want to talk about the meaning of life today, and uh, so many people over time have searched for the meaning of life. And certainly the book of Ecclesiastes is a detailed account of Solomon's life and his searching after meaning and purpose. And certainly he alludes to the meaning he found in life here when he finally boils it down to one uh, finding a proper relationship uh, through the things that God has given him and a right relationship with this one uh, who he owes his life. All the people who have ever lived have been on a search for the meaning of life. Many have never realized it. The search for the meaning of life has mad and sad and uh, many turns uh, in it. Some are humorous, some are tragic. Consider the one who discovered that the hokey pokey was the meaning of life because that's what it's all about. <laughs> well, it's not what it's all about. And I can tell you personally that the meaning of life isn't found in telling corny jokes either. King Solomon, reputed to be the wisest man who ever lived, wrote to us in this word from God, a summation of all the proverbs he had ever collected. The one thing that runs throughout it is that the meaning of life is inscrutable to most human beings. However, that doesn't mean that true meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life cannot be found. Certainly, Solomon thought that a connection to God has everything to do with satisfaction and happiness, meaning and purpose in life. So the first faith lesson is that striving after things truly is, as Solomon said, a, a, a trying to catch the wind, a, a, a source of meaninglessness. So many people in this world run around in circles chasing their tail like a dog because they're trying to find that which continues to elude them. It's just out of reach. There are a lot of ways of restating this wisdom, but we've all witnessed this principle throughout our living. Our desires tell us that we'd be happier if, and you just fill in the blank right there, if this or if that. And many people go from this if, and, or but, and they never find their happiness because they're chasing after things. They think that one more expensive thing or one more shiny thing or one more elusive thing, if they can just find it, is going to bring them happiness. And yet, many of them find a little of that 
happiness along the way, and yet they don't find it to be lasting. And they've got to have more of it. Or they've got to have a different kind of it. Perhaps money is going to make them happier. Or it's more entertainment will make them happier. More travel, more uh, chasing after the things of this world. Expensive cars, you fill in a blank. And so many of us try to be happier because we think that this new thing that our eyes have caught hold of is going to make us happy. Jesus has told us, watch out and be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. There it is. Things are not going to make us happy. Why are all these strivings meaningless? Solomon tells us what we already know, but don't want to ourselves believe. The truth is that our desires are never going to be fulfilled by having more of anything. We will literally work ourselves into despair in an attempt to get those. But let's say that you've got great success and you've been able to reach a pinnacle of power or money or, or some other thing that you strived after. Are you going to be happy then? You soon tire of maintaining what you've achieved and you resent those who might take it away. And you'll find today that many people who, who have uh, attained to fame or wealth or uh, a combination of these things find their lives unhappy. Yes, we read it in all the tabloids. Uh, I hope you don't read too many of those because they're a sordid tale of people chasing after something elusive, hoping that maybe they'll get a hint of what it is that is really missing. But there, there is no substance to what is found in those tabloids because they don't point to any of the real answers. You aren't going to be famous, powerful, handsome, beautiful forever. And you must face the fact that you can't hold on to any of this because life is short and we all soon die. Now, those words are sobering. They may even depress you, but they shouldn't if we have found the meaning of life. It's all because of the truth of this, and we know because we've got so many examples of famous people who have ended their lives in suicide. They thought that these things that they chased after were going to make them happy, but in the end, it was a chasing after the wind, as Solomon said. Meaningless, meaningless. They reached a pinnacle of sorts, and then they realized that this didn't make them happy at all. And that made them even more despondent. There was nowhere to go but down from there. Solomon states the obvious. He says, what does a man get from all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All of his days and his work, his pain, his grief, even at night, his mind doesn't rest. This, too, is meaningless. So don't chase after things. They're never going to make you happy. Even if you attain many of them, you're going to find yourself despondent in the end because they cannot fulfill you. Why is that? We have been made for relationship. So the second lesson is that we can find joy and purpose in life through relationship. Now think about this. Many of us don't have many good relationships, and it's because we're selfish. We're still chasing after those things. We're chasing after the wrong thing. And that's our problem. We can't be happy. We are restless. We uh, avoid the things that really are going to help us. We can't see what is right in front of us. The best things in life, it turns out, are not things. Rather, the only true desire that should be followed is to find what really satisfies that spirit that is dwelling within us. The body, on the other hand, can never be satisfied by whatever quantity we acquire. The eyes are always searching for more and better things. Desire drives lust and turns people into objects to be used and discarded. The mind always tells us that more and better can be achieved, even if we're not able to do it. But wisdom asks the question, to what end? To what end? Are you chasing after the wind? Meaningless? The spirit seeks relationship, peace, joy, blessing, happiness. It quests after what the Apostle Paul tells us are the only qualities that are going to continue on without end. He said these three things remain, faith, Hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Did you catch any of that faith, hope, and love? 
None of these qualities can be found in selfish desiring after things. They can only be found in right relationship. And a right relationship truly begins when we make peace with ourselves and our God who created us and then begin a right relationship. Solomon directs us toward this piece of wisdom when he says, a man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. He said, this too I see is from the hand of God, for without him, who can eat or drink or find enjoyment? You see, here's the crux of the matter. We need a right relationship first with God. Is that not the greatest command found in our Bibles? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. God is telling us what's good for us. We just don't want to take the medicine. We think we already know what's good for us. Broken and unfulfilled relationships will always be a source of pain for us until we find this key ingredient for a happy life. Work is meant to produce in us satisfaction for things well done, to provide for the ones that we love, to honor and bless the lives around us. Unfortunately, the world sees work as a means of more accumulation, a means of honoring yourself. Jesus, too, knew that life was about relationship with God and with neighbors. If not, why would he have tried to rescue so many who found themselves on the treadmill of life, working their lives away toward meaninglessness? He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what we want. We want rest from this meaningless life, this toiling, this striving after nothing, that which we cannot attain through things. Jesus was also concerned that so many had no real relationship with God and their minds were troubled continuously. He says, and I quote, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink or about your body or what you will have to wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you as well. Real life has purpose beyond ourself. The last faith lesson is that there is purpose for life and power for living and it's available all through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We are indeed fortunate to have the words of Jesus and his promises that are still available to us in the Bible. Poor Solomon didn't have the words of our Lord, but he had already discerned that the relationship with God was the most important thing that he had. His final conclusion in the book of Ecclesiastes isn't wrong. It just didn't have the fullness of the good news that Jesus brought us. Solomon wrote, now all has been heard, and here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandment, for this is the whole duty of man. Well, he's right. If we would listen to God in the first place, we would love the Lord our God. We would love others around us and be in right relationship with them. Friends, fear and obedience may be the beginning of wisdom, but it isn't the end thereof. No, Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it to the fullest. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we really need? Isn't that what will satisfy our inner soul and spirit? Yes, it's good news that we can be saved from God's wrath through faith in Jesus our Lord, but that's not the end of the good news. Nevertheless, God also sent Jesus to help us comprehend that life had meaning. Life had purpose. It's not just all about evangelism. It's about living in such a way that we are the embodiment of God's love that we become the ambassadors of God's grace, that we share in the goodness of God's kingdom so that others too come into it. We have also been promised God's spirit to empower us, to guide and lead us to truth, truth that rejoices and restores this world to thanksgiving and praise. We take time in every worship service here at this church so that we stop and have fellowship and it's so sorely needed in the world around us because it is a foretaste of that which God created us for. We need to be in right relationship 
We need to love one another properly. Friends, wherever there is want or pain or distress or grief, that's where we ought to be found. Life does not consist of counting our blessings while ignoring those who are being cursed by living broken and fallen lives. We were created for relationships that restore others into faith that we have been trusted into. We were created to share the blessings of God and lead others into the light of God's truth. We were created to be the body of Christ, active and alive in the grace of God. Do you want to know the meaning of life? John 17, 3, Jesus speaks of it. He says, and I quote, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is life. And through a right relationship, we can begin to love others around us. We can begin to love again the God who created us and to find wonder and miracles all around us, to find ourselves in a life that is meaningful, full of purpose. Do you want a life that's full of purpose, that knows love, that is power for living? Jesus taught us the greatest command. Love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. Now, I don't know how to say it more simply than embrace God's plan to love and bless one another. And the blessings of God will return in such a quantity that you will be unable to hold them. Friends, when you give out of love, when you give out of yourself, trust me, God has already made it his plan to bless you and return more to you than you've given. Truly, we can find happiness. We can find meaning and purpose through our living. It begins with a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let those who have ears hear, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I want to thank you for joining me in worship today. I hope this message touched your heart, for it is pointed straight at the truth of our living, the meaning and purpose of our living. Take time to pray over it, meditate on it, and you too will find that this is the only way to true happiness, to true satisfaction in living. Now go, we've been given the best news ever. God has loved us not because we're perfect, but even in spite of our sin. Then go and share that same kind of love and life with others. In Jesus' name, amen.